World War I Progress of the War Opening Hostilities Confusion among the Central Powers The strategy of the Central Powers suffered from miscommunication. Germany had promised to support Austria-Hungary's invasion of Serbia, but interpretations of what this meant differed. Previously tested deployment plans had been replaced early in 1914, but those had never been tested in exercises. Austro-Hungarian leaders believed Germany would cover its northern flank against Russia. Germany, however, envisioned Austria-Hungary directing most of its troops against Russia, while Germany dealt with France. This confusion forced the Austro-Hungarian army to divide its forces between the Russian and Serbian fronts. Serbian Campaign Austria invaded and fought the Serbian army at the Battle of Sur and Battle of Kalyabura beginning on 12 August. Over the next two weeks, Austrian attacks were thrown back with heavy losses, which marked the first major Allied victories of the war and dashed Austro-Hungarian hopes of a swift victory. As a result, Austria had to keep sizable forces on the Serbian front, weakening its efforts against Russia. Serbia's defeat of the Austro-Hungarian invasion of 1914 has been called one of the major upset victories of the 20th century. German Offensive in Belgium and France When the war began, the German order of battle placed 80% of the army in the west, with the remainder acting as a screening force in the east. The plan was to quickly knock France out of the war, then redeploy to the east and do the same to Russia. The German offensive in the West was officially titled Aufmarsch to West, but is better known as the Schlieffen Plan, after its original creator. Schlieffen deliberately kept the German left, i.e. its positions in Alsace-Lorraine, weak to lure the French into attacking there, while the majority were allocated to the German right, so as to sweep through Belgium, encircle Paris and trap the French armies against the Swiss border. The French charged into Alsace-Lorraine on the outbreak of war as envisaged by their Plan 17 thus actually aiding this strategy. However, Schlieffen's successor Moltke grew concerned that the French might push too hard on his left flank. As such, as the German army increased in size in the years leading up to the war, he changed the allocation of forces between the German right and left wings from 85-15 to 70-30. Ultimately, Moltke's changes meant insufficient forces to achieve decisive success and thus unrealistic goals and timings. The initial German advance in the West was very successful. By the end of August the Allied left, which included the British Expeditionary Force, BEF, was in full retreat. French casualties in the first month exceeded 260,000, including 27,000 killed on 22nd of August during the Battle of the Frontiers. German planning provided broad strategic instructions, while allowing army commanders considerable freedom in carrying them out at the front. This worked well in 1866 and 1870 but in 1914. Von Kluck used this freedom to disobey orders, opening a gap between the German armies as they closed on Paris. The French and British exploited this gap to halt the German advance east of Paris at the First Battle of the Marne from 5 to 12 September and pushed the German forces back some 50 kilometers, 31 miles. In 1911, the Russian Stavka had agreed with the French to attack Germany within 15 days of mobilization. This was unrealistic and the two Russian armies that entered East Prussia on 17 August did so without many of their support elements. The Russian Second Army was effectively destroyed at the Battle of Tannenberg on 26-30 August but the Russian advance caused the Germans to reroute their 8th Field Army from France to East Prussia, a factor in Allied victory on the Marne. By the end of 1914, German troops held strong defensive positions inside France controlled the bulk of France's domestic coal fields and had inflicted 230,000 more casualties than it lost itself. However, communications problems and questionable command decisions cost Germany the chance of a decisive outcome while it had failed to achieve the primary objective of avoiding a long, two-front war. This amounted to a strategic defeat. Shortly after the Marne, Crown Prince Wilhelm told an American reporter, We have lost the war. It will go on for a long time but lost it is already. Asia and the Pacific New Zealand occupied German Samoa, later Western Samoa, on August 30, 1914. On 11 September, the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force landed on the island of Noi Paman, later New Britain, which formed part of German New Guinea. On 28 October, 
the German cruiser SMS and sank the Russian cruiser Zemchug in the Battle of Penang. Japan seized Germany's Micronesian colonies and, after the siege of Tsingtao, the German coaling port of Qingdao on the Chinese Shandong Peninsula. As Vienna refused to withdraw the Austro-Hungarian cruiser SMS Kaiser and Elizabeth from Tsingtao, Japan declared war not only on Germany, but also on Austria-Hungary. The ship participated in the defense of Tsingtao where it was sunk in November 1914. Within a few months, the Allied forces had seized all the German territories in the Pacific, only isolated commerce raiders and a few holdouts in New Guinea remained. African Campaigns Some of the first clashes of the war involved British, French, and German colonial forces in Africa. On 6-7 August, French and British troops invaded the German protectorate of Togoland and Cameroon. On 10th of August, German forces in southwest Africa attacked South Africa, sporadic and fierce fighting continued for the rest of the war. The German colonial forces in German East Africa, led by Colonel Paul von Letta Vorbeck, fought a guerrilla warfare campaign during World War I and only surrendered two weeks after the armistice took effect in Europe. Indian Support for the Allies Germany attempted to use Indian nationalism and pan-Islamism to its advantage, instigating uprisings in India, and sending a mission that urged Afghanistan to join the war on the side of central powers. However, contrary to British fears of a revolt in India, the outbreak of the war saw an unprecedented outpouring of loyalty and goodwill towards Britain. Indian political leaders from the Indian National Congress and other groups were eager to support the British war effort since they believed that strong support for the war effort would further the cause of Indian home rule. The Indian army in fact outnumbered the British army at the beginning of the war, about 1.3 million Indian soldiers and laborers served in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, while the central government and the princely states sent large supplies of food, money, and ammunition. In all, 140,000 men served on the Western Front and nearly 700,000 in the Middle East. Casualties of Indian soldiers totaled 47,746 killed and 65,126 wounded during World War I. The suffering engendered by the war, as well as the failure of the British government to grant self-government to India after the end of hostilities, bred disillusionment and fueled the campaign for full independence that would be led by Mohandas K. Gandhi and others. Western Front Trench warfare begins. Military tactics developed before World War I failed to keep pace with advances in technology and had become obsolete. These advances had allowed the creation of strong defensive systems, which out-of-date military tactics could not break through for most of the war. Barbed wire was a significant hindrance to massed infantry advances, while artillery, vastly more lethal than in the 1870s, coupled with machine guns, made crossing open ground extremely difficult. Commanders on both sides failed to develop tactics for breaching entrenched positions without heavy casualties. In time, however, technology began to produce new offensive weapons, such as gas warfare in the tank. After the First Battle of the Marne, 5 September 12, 1914, Allied and German forces unsuccessfully tried to outflank each other, a series of maneuvers later known as the Race to the Sea. By the end of 1914, the opposing forces were left confronting each other along an uninterrupted line of entrenched positions from Alsace to Belgium's North Sea coast. Since the Germans were able to choose where to stand, they normally had the advantage of the high ground. In addition, their trenches tended to be better built, since Anglo-French trenches were initially intended as temporary, preparatory to breaking the German defenses. Both sides tried to break the stalemate using scientific and technological advances. On April 22, 1915, at the Second Battle of Ypres, the Germans, violating the Hague Convention, used chlorine gas for the first time on the Western Front. Several types of gas soon became widely used by both sides, and though it never proved a decisive, battle-winning weapon, poison gas became one of the most feared and best-remembered horrors of the war. Tanks were developed by Britain and France and were first used in combat by the British during the Battle of fleurs Courcelette, part of the Battle of the Somme, on September 15, 1916 with only partial success. However, their effectiveness would grow as the war progressed, the Allies built tanks in large numbers, whilst the Germans employed only a few of their own design, supplemented by captured Allied tanks. Continuation of Trench Warfare 
neither side proved able to deliver a decisive blow for the next two years. Throughout 1915-17, the British Empire and France suffered more casualties than Germany, because of both the strategic and tactical stances chosen by the sides. Strategically, while the Germans only mounted one major offensive, the Allies made several attempts to break through the German lines. In February 1916 the Germans attacked French defensive positions at the Battle of Verdun, lasting until December 1916. The Germans made initial gains, before French counterattacks returned matters to near their starting point. Casualties were greater for the French, but the Germans bled heavily as well, with anywhere from 700,000 to 975,000 casualties suffered between the two combatants. Verdun became a symbol of French determination and self-sacrifice. The Battle of the Somme was an Anglo-French offensive of July to November 1916. The opening day of the offensive, July 1, 1916, was the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army, suffering 57,470 casualties, including 19,240 dead. The entire Somme offensive cost the British Army some 420,000 casualties. The French suffered another estimated 200,000 casualties and the Germans an estimated 500,000. Gunfire wasn't the only factor taking lives, the diseases that emerged in the trenches were a major killer on both sides. The living conditions made it so that countless diseases and infections occurred, such as trench foot, shell shock, blindness slash burns from mustard gas, lice, trench fever, cooties, body lice, and the Spanish flu. To maintain morale, wartime censors minimized early reports of widespread influenza illness and mortality in Germany, the United Kingdom, France, and the United States. Papers were free to report the epidemic's effects in neutral Spain, such as the grave illness of King Alfonso XIII. This created a false impression of Spain as especially hard hit, thereby giving rise to the pandemic's nickname, Spanish Flu. Protracted action at Verdun throughout 1916, combined with the bloodletting at the Somme, brought the exhausted French army to the brink of collapse. Feudal attempts using frontal assault came at a high price for both the British and the French and led to the widespread French army mutinies, after the failure of the costly Nivelle Offensive of April to May 1917. The concurrent British Battle of Arras was more limited in scope, and more successful, although ultimately of little strategic value. A smaller part of the Arras Offensive, the capture of Vimy Ridge by the Canadian Corps, became highly significant to that country. The idea that Canada's national identity was born out of the battle is an opinion widely held in military and general histories of Canada. The last large-scale offensive of this period was a British attack, with French support, at Passchendaele, July to November 1917. This offensive opened with great promise for the Allies, before bogging down in the October mud. Casualties, though disputed, were roughly equal, at some 200,000 to 400,000 per side. The years of trench warfare on the Western Front achieved no major exchanges of territory and, as a result, are often thought of as static and unchanging. However, throughout this period, British, French, and German tactics constantly evolved to meet new battlefield challenges. Naval War At the start of the war, the German Empire had cruisers scattered across the globe, some of which were subsequently used to attack Allied merchant shipping. The British Royal Navy systematically hunted them down, though not without some embarrassment from its inability to protect Allied shipping. Before the beginning of the war, it was widely understood that Britain held the position of strongest, most influential navy in the world. The publishing of the book The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by Alfred Thayer Mahan in 1890 was intended to encourage the United States to increase their naval power. Instead, this book made it to Germany and inspired its readers to try to overpower the British Royal Navy. For example, the German detached light cruiser SMS Emden, part of the East Asia Squadron stationed at Qingdao, seized or destroyed 15 merchantmen, as well as sinking a Russian cruiser and a French destroyer. However, most of the German East Asia Squadron, consisting of the armored cruisers SMS Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, light cruisers Nuremberg and Leipzig and two transport ships, did not have orders to raid shipping and was instead underway to Germany when it met British warships. The German flotilla in Dresden sank two armored cruisers at the Battle of Coronel, but was virtually destroyed at the Battle of the Falkland Islands in December 1914, with only Dresden and a few auxiliaries escaping. 
but after the Battle of Mossetiera these two had been destroyed or interned. Soon after the outbreak of hostilities, Britain began a naval blockade of Germany. The strategy proved effective, cutting off vital military and civilian supplies, although this blockade violated accepted international law codified by several international agreements of the past two centuries. Britain mined international waters to prevent any ships from entering entire sections of ocean, causing danger to even neutral ships. Since there was limited response to this tactic of the British, Germany expected a similar response to its unrestricted submarine warfare. The Battle of Jutland, German, Skagerrakschlacht, or Battle of the Skagerrak, in May-June 1916 developed into the largest naval battle of the war. It was the only full-scale clash of battleships during the war, and one of the largest in history. The Kaiserliche Marine's High Seas Fleet, commanded by Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer, fought the Royal Navy's Grand Fleet led by Admiral Sir John Jellicoe. The engagement was a standoff, as the Germans were outmaneuvered by the larger British fleet, but managed to escape and inflicted more damage to the British fleet than they received. Strategically, however, the British asserted their control of the sea, and the bulk of the German surface fleet remained confined to port for the duration of the war. German U-boats attempted to cut the supply lines between North America and Britain. The nature of submarine warfare meant that attacks often came without warning giving the crews of the merchant ships little hope of survival. The United States launched a protest, and Germany changed its rules of engagement. After the sinking of the passenger ship RMS Lusitania in 1915, Germany promised not to target passenger liners, while Britain armed its merchant ships, placing them beyond the protection of the cruiser rules, which demanded warning and movement of crews to a place of safety, a standard that lifeboats did not meet. Finally, in early 1917, Germany adopted a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare, realizing that the Americans would eventually enter the war. Germany sought to strangle Allied sea lanes before the United States could transport a large army overseas, but after initial successes eventually failed to do so. The U-boat threat lessened in 1917, when merchant ships began traveling in convoys, escorted by destroyers. This tactic made it difficult for U-boats to find targets, which significantly lessened losses. After the hydrophone and depth charges were introduced, accompanying destroyers could attack a submerged submarine with some hope of success. Convoys slowed the flow of supplies, since ships had to wait as convoys were assembled. The solution to the delays was an extensive program of building new freighters. Troop ships were too fast for the submarines and did not travel the North Atlantic in convoys. The U-boats had sunk more than 5,000 Allied ships at a cost of 199 submarines. World War I also saw the first use of aircraft carriers in combat, with HMS Furious launching Sopwith Camels in a successful raid against the Zeppelin hangars at Tondern in July 1918, as well as blimps for anti-submarine patrol. Southern Theaters War in the Balkans Faced with Russia in the east Austria-Hungary could spare only one-third of its army to attack Serbia. After suffering heavy losses, the Austrians briefly occupied the Serbian capital, Belgrade. A Serbian counterattack in the Battle of Kaljubra succeeded in driving them from the country by the end of 1914. For the first ten months of 1915, Austria-Hungary used most of its military reserves to fight Italy. German and Austro-Hungarian diplomats, however, scored a coup by persuading Bulgaria to join the attack on Serbia. The Austro-Hungarian provinces of Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia provided troops for Austria-Hungary in the fight with Serbia, Russia, and Italy. Montenegro allied itself with Serbia. Bulgaria declared war on Serbia on October 12, 1915 and joined in the attack by the Austro-Hungarian army under Mackensen's army of 250,000 that was already underway. Serbia was conquered in a little more than a month as the Central Powers, now including Bulgaria, sent in 600,000 troops total. The Serbian army, fighting on two fronts and facing certain defeat, retreated into northern Albania. The Serbs suffered defeat in the Battle of Kosovo. Montenegro covered the Serbian retreat towards the Adriatic coast in the Battle of Mojkovac in 6 January 7, 1916, but ultimately the Austrians also conquered Montenegro. The surviving Serbian soldiers were evacuated by ship to Greece. After conquest, Serbia was divided between Austro-Hungary and Bulgaria. In late 1915, a Franco-British force landed at Salonika in Greece to offer assistance and to pressure its government to declare war against the Central Powers. However, 
The pro-German King Constantine I dismissed the pro-Allied government of Eleftherios Venizelos before the Allied expeditionary force arrived. The friction between the King of Greece and the Allies continued to accumulate with the national schism, which effectively divided Greece between regions still loyal to the King and the new provisional government of Venizelos in Salonika. After intense negotiations and an armed confrontation in Athens between Allied and Royalist forces, an incident known as No in Vienna, the King of Greece resigned and his second son Alexander took his place, Greece officially joined the war on the side of the Allies in June 1917. The Macedonian front was initially mostly static. French and Serbian forces retook limited areas of Macedonia by recapturing Betala on November 19, 1916 following the costly Monastir offensive, which brought stabilization of the front. Serbian and French troops finally made a breakthrough in September 1918 in the Vardar offensive, after most of the German and Austro-Hungarian troops had been withdrawn. The Bulgarians were defeated at the Battle of Dobropol and by 25 September British and French troops had crossed the border into Bulgaria proper as the Bulgarian army collapsed. Bulgaria capitulated four days later, on September 29, 1918. The German high command responded by dispatching troops to hold the line, but these forces were far too weak to re-establish a front. The disappearance of the Macedonian front meant that the road to Budapest and Vienna was now open to Allied forces. Hindenburg and Ludendorff concluded that the strategic and operational balance had now shifted decidedly against the Central Powers and, a day after the Bulgarian collapse, insisted on an immediate peace settlement. Ottoman Empire The Ottomans threatened Russia's Caucasian territories and Britain's communications with India via the Suez Canal. As the conflict progressed, the Ottoman Empire took advantage of the European powers' preoccupation with the war and conducted large-scale ethnic cleansing of the indigenous Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian Christian populations, known as the Armenian Genocide, Greek Genocide, and Assyrian Genocide. The British and French opened overseas fronts with the Gallipoli, 1915, and Mesopotamian campaigns, 1914. In Gallipoli, the Ottoman Empire successfully repelled the British, French, an Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, Anzacs. In Mesopotamia, by contrast, after the defeat of the British defenders in the siege of Kut by the Ottomans, 1915-16, British Imperial forces reorganized and captured Baghdad in March 1917. The British were aided in Mesopotamia by local Arab and Assyrian tribesmen, while the Ottomans employed local Kurdish and Turkoman tribes. Further to the west, the Suez Canal was defended from Ottoman attacks in 1915 and 1916. In August, a German and Ottoman force was defeated at the Battle of Romani by the Anzac Mounted Division and the 52nd, Lowland, Infantry Division. Following this victory, an Egyptian expeditionary force advanced across the Sinai Peninsula, pushing Ottoman forces back in the Battle of Magdaba in December and the Battle of Rafa on the border between the Egyptian Sinai and Ottoman Palestine in January 1917. Russian armies generally had success in the Caucasus. Andrew Pasha, supreme commander of the Ottoman armed forces, was ambitious and dreamed of reconquering Central Asia and areas that had been lost to Russia previously. He was, however, a poor commander. He launched an offensive against the Russians in the Caucasus in December 1914 with 100,000 troops, insisting on a frontal attack against mountainous Russian positions in winter. He lost 86% of his force at the Battle of Sari Kamish. The Ottoman Empire, with German support, invaded Persia, modern Iran, in December 1914 in an effort to cut off British and Russian access to petroleum reservoirs around Bakun near the Caspian Sea. Persia, ostensibly neutral, had long been under the spheres of British and Russian influence. The Ottomans and Germans were aided by Kurdish and Azeri forces, together with a large number of major Iranian tribes, such as the Qashqai, Tangistanis, Loristanis, and Kameh while the Russians and British had the support of Armenian and Assyrian forces. The Persian campaign was to last until 1918 and end in failure for the Ottomans and their allies. However, the Russian withdrawal from the war in 1917 led to Armenian and Assyrian forces, who had hitherto inflicted a series of defeats upon the forces of the Ottomans and their allies, being cut off from supply lines, outnumbered, outgunned and isolated, forcing them to fight and flee towards British lines in northern Mesopotamia. General Yudinich, the Russian commander from 1915 to 1916, 
drove the Turks out of most of the southern Caucasus with a string of victories. In 1917, Russian Grand Duke Nicholas assumed command of the Caucasus Front. Nicholas planned a railway from Russian Georgia to the conquered territories, so that fresh supplies could be brought up for a new offensive in 1917. However, in March 1917, February in the pre-revolutionary Russian calendar, the Tsar abdicated in the course of the February Revolution, and the Russian Caucasus army began to fall apart. The Arab Revolt, instigated by the Arab Bureau of the British Foreign Office, started June 1916 with the Battle of Mecca, led by Sharif Hussein of Mecca, and ended with the Ottoman surrender of Damascus. Fakhri Pasha, the Ottoman commander of Medina, resisted for more than two and a half years during the siege of Medina before surrendering in January 1919. The Senussi tribe, along the border of Italian Libya and British Egypt, incited and armed by the Turks, waged a small-scale guerrilla war against Allied troops. The British were forced to dispatch 12,000 troops to oppose them in the Senussi campaign. Their rebellion was finally crushed in mid-1916. Total Allied casualties on the Ottoman fronts amounted 650,000 men. Total Ottoman casualties were 725,000. 325,000 dead and 400,000 wounded. Italian Participation Italy had been allied with the German and Austro-Hungarian empires since 1882 as part of the Triple Alliance. However, the nation had its own designs on Austrian territory in Trentino, the Austrian littoral, Fiume, Rijeka, and Dalmatia. Rome had a secret 1902 pact with France, effectively nullifying its part in the Triple Alliance, Italy secretly agreed with France to remain neutral if the latter was attacked by Germany. At the start of hostilities, Italy refused to commit troops, arguing that the Triple Alliance was defensive and that Austria-Hungary was an aggressor. The Austro-Hungarian government began negotiations to secure Italian neutrality, offering the French colony of Tunisia in return. The Allies made a counteroffer in which Italy would receive the southern Tyrol, Austrian littoral and territory on the Dalmatian coast after the defeat of Austria-Hungary. This was formalized by the Treaty of London. Further encouraged by the Allied invasion of Turkey in April 1915, Italy joined the Triple Entente and declared war on Austria-Hungary on 23 May. Fifteen months later, Italy declared war on Germany. The Italians had numerical superiority. But this advantage was lost, not only because of the difficult terrain in which the fighting took place, but also because of the strategies and tactics employed. Field Marshal Luigi Cadorna, a staunch proponent of the frontal assault, had dreams of breaking into the Slovenian plateau, taking Ljubljana and threatening Vienna. On the Trentino front, the Austro-Hungarians took advantage of the mountainous terrain, which favored the defender. After an initial strategic retreat, the front remained largely unchanged, while Austrian Kaiserschützen and Stanzschützen engaged Italian Alpini in bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat throughout the summer. The Austro-Hungarians counterattacked in the Alto Piano of Asiago, towards Verona and Padua, in the spring of 1916, strafe expedition, but made little progress and were defeated by the Italians. Beginning in 1915, the Italians under Cadorna mounted 11 offensives on the Isonzo front along the Isonzo, Soca, River northeast of Trieste. Of this 11 offensives, five were won by Italy, three remained inconclusive, and other three were repelled by the Austro-Hungarians, who held the higher ground. In the summer of 1916, after the Battle of Doberdu, the Italians captured the town of Gorizia. After this victory, the front remained static for over a year, despite several Italian offensives, centered on the Banchis and Karst plateau east of Gorizia. The Central Powers launched a crushing offensive on October 26, 1917, spearheaded by the Germans, and achieved a victory at Caporetto, Cobrid. The Italian army was routed and retreated more than 100 kilometers, 62 miles, to reorganize. The new Italian chief of staff, Armando Diaz, ordered the army to stop their retreat and defend the Monte Grappa summit, where fortified defenses were constructed. The Italians repelled the Austro-Hungarian and German army, and stabilized the front at the Piave River. Since the Italian army had suffered heavy losses in the Battle of Caporetto, the Italian government ordered conscription of the so-called 99 boys, Rigazzi del 99, all males born in 1899 and prior, who were 18 years old or older. In 1918, 
the Austro-Hungarians failed to break through in a series of battles on the Piave and were finally decisively defeated in the Battle of Vittorio Veneto in October. On 1 November, the Italian navy destroyed much of the Austro-Hungarian fleet stationed in Pula, preventing it from being handed over to the new state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs. On 3 November, the Italians invaded Trieste from the sea. On the same day, the armistice of Village Usti was signed. By mid-November 1918, the Italian military occupied the entire former Austrian littoral and had seized control of the portion of Dalmatia that had been guaranteed to Italy by the London Pact. By the end of hostilities in November 1918, Admiral Enrico Millo declared himself Italy's governor of Dalmatia. Austria-Hungary surrendered on November 11, 1918. Romanian Participation Romania had been allied with the Central Powers since 1882. When the war began, however, it declared its neutrality, arguing that because Austria-Hungary had itself declared war on Serbia, Romania was under no obligation to join the war. On August 4, 1916, Romania and the Entente signed the political treaty and military convention, that established the coordinates of Romania's participation in the war. In return, it received the Allies' formal sanction for Transylvania, Banat and other territories of Austria-Hungary to be annexed to Romania. The action had large popular support on August 27, 1916, the Romanian army launched an attack against Austria-Hungary, with limited Russian support. The Romanian offensive was initially successful, against the Austro-Hungarian troops in Transylvania, but a counterattack by the forces of the Central Powers drove them back. As a result of the Battle of Bucharest, the Central Powers occupied Bucharest on December 6, 1916. Fighting in Moldova continued in 1917, resulting in some battles won by Romanians at Marisesti, Maristi and Oituz and a costly stalemate for the Central Powers. Russian withdrawal from the war in late 1917 as a result of the October Revolution meant that Romania was forced to sign an armistice with the Central Powers on December 9, 1917. In January 1918, Romanian forces established control over Bessarabia as the Russian army abandoned the province. Although a treaty was signed by the Romanian and Bolshevik Russian governments following talks between 5 and March 9, 1918 on the withdrawal of Romanian forces from Bessarabia within two months, on March 27, 1918 Romania formally attached Bessarabia, inhabited by a Romanian majority, to its territory, based on a resolution passed by the local assembly of that territory on its unification with Romania. Romania officially made peace with the Central Powers by signing the Treaty of Bucharest on May 7, 1918. Under the treaty, Romania was obliged to end the war with the Central Powers and make small territorial concessions to Austria-Hungary, ceding control of some passes in the Carpathian Mountains, and to grant oil concessions to Germany. In exchange, the Central Powers recognized the sovereignty of Romania over Bessarabia. The treaty was renounced in October 1918 by the Alexandra Mark Eileman government, and Romania nominally re-entered the war on November 10, 1918. The next day, the Treaty of Bucharest was nullified by the terms of the Armistice of Compiègne. Total Romanian deaths from 1914 to 1918, military and civilian, within contemporary borders, were estimated at 748,000. Eastern Front Initial actions Russian plans for the start of the war called for simultaneous invasions of Austrian Galicia and East Prussia. Although Russia's initial advance into Galicia was largely successful, it was driven back from East Prussia by Hindenburg and Ludendorff at the battles of Tannenberg and the Missourian Lakes in August and September 1914. Russia's less developed industrial base and ineffective military leadership were instrumental in the events that unfolded. By the spring of 1915, the Russians had retreated to Galicia, and, in May, the Central Powers achieved a remarkable breakthrough on Poland's southern frontiers with their Gorlice Tarnyth offensive. On 5 August, they captured Warsaw and forced the Russians to withdraw from Poland. Russian Revolution Despite Russia's success in the June 1916 Brusilov offensive against the Austrians in eastern Galicia, the offensive was undermined by the reluctance of other Russian generals to commit their forces to support the victory. Allied and Russian forces were revived only temporarily by Romania's entry into the war on 27 August. 
German forces came to the aid of embattled Austro-Hungarian units in Transylvania while a German-Bulgarian force attacked from the south. Bucharest was taken by the Central Powers on 6 December but Romania continued the war on the Allied side, scoring the victories of Maristi, Marisesti and Oituz in 1917. Meanwhile, unrest grew in Russia as the Tsar remained at the front. The increasingly incompetent rule of Empress Alexandra drew protests and resulted in the murder of her favorite, Rasputin, at the end of 1916. In March 1917, Demonstrations in Petrograd culminated in the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II and the appointment of the weak provisional government, which shared power with the Petrograd Soviet Socialists. This arrangement led to confusion and chaos both at the front and at home. The army became increasingly ineffective. Following the Tsar's abdication, Vladimir Lenin, with the help of the German government, was ushered by train from Switzerland into Russia April 16, 1917. Discontent and the weaknesses of the provisional government led to a rise in the popularity of the Bolshevik Party, led by Lenin, which demanded an immediate end to the war. The revolution of November was followed in December by an armistice and negotiations with Germany. At first, the Bolsheviks refused the German terms, but when German troops began marching across Ukraine unopposed, the new government acceded to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on March 3, 1918. The treaty ceded vast territories, including Finland the Baltic provinces, parts of Poland and Ukraine to the Central Powers. Despite this enormous German success, the manpower required by the Germans to occupy the captured territory may have contributed to the failure of the spring offensive, and secured relatively little food or other material for the Central Powers' war effort. With the adoption of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the Entente no longer existed. The Allied powers led a small-scale invasion of Russia partly to stop Germany from exploiting Russian resources, and to a lesser extent, to support the Whites, as opposed to the Reds, in the Russian Civil War. Allied troops landed in Arkhangelsk and in Vladivostok as part of the North Russia intervention. On November 10, 1918, one day before the end of World War I, Romania redeclared war on the Central Powers, thus reigniting the Eastern Front. On 11 November, the last day of the war, the Romanian army occupied Chernivtsi, the capital of the Austrian Duchy of Bukovina. Czechoslovak Legion The Czechoslovak Legion fought with the Entente, its goal was to win support for the independence of Czechoslovakia. The Legion in Russia was established in September 1914, in December 1917 in France, including volunteers from America, and in April 1918 in Italy. Czechoslovak Legion troops defeated the Austro-Hungarian army at the Ukrainian village of Sporov, in July 1917. After this success, the number of Czechoslovak legionaries increased, as well as Czechoslovak military power. In the Battle of Bakhmich, the Legion defeated the Germans and forced them to make a truce. In Russia, they were heavily involved in the Russian Civil War, siding with the Whites against the Bolsheviks at times controlling most of the Trans-Siberian Railway and conquering all the major cities of Siberia. The presence of the Czechoslovak Legion near Yekaterinburg appears to have been one of the motivations for the Bolshevik execution of the Tsar and his family in July 1918. Legionaries arrived less than a week afterwards and captured the city. Because Russia's European ports were not safe, the Corps was evacuated by a long detour via the port of Vladivostok. The last transport was the American ship Hefron in September 1920. Central Powers Peace Overtures On December 12, 1916, after ten brutal months of the Battle of Verdun and a successful offensive against Romania, Germany attempted to negotiate a peace with the Allies. However, this attempt was rejected out of hand as a duplicitous war ruse. Soon after, the U.S. President, Woodrow Wilson, attempted to intervene as a peacemaker, asking in a note for both sides to state their demands. Lloyd George's war cabinet considered the German offer to be a ploy to create divisions amongst the Allies. After initial outrage and much deliberation, they took Wilson's note as a separate effort, signaling that the United States was on the verge of entering the war against Germany following the submarine outrages. While the Allies debated a response to Wilson's offer, the Germans chose to rebuff it in favor of a direct exchange of views. Learning of the German response, the Allied governments were free to make clear demands in their response of 14 January. They sought restoration of damages, 
the evacuation of occupied territories, reparations for France, Russia, and Romania, and a recognition of the principle of nationalities. This included the liberation of Italians, Slavs, Romanians, Czechoslovaks, and the creation of a free and united Poland. On the question of security, the Allies sought guarantees that would prevent or limit future wars, complete with sanctions, as a condition of any peace settlement. The negotiations failed and the Entente powers rejected the German offer on the grounds that Germany had not put forward any specific proposals. 1917-1918 Events of 1917 proved decisive in ending the war, although their effects were not fully felt until 1918. Developments in 1917 The British naval blockade began to have a serious impact on Germany. In response, in February 1917, the German general staff convinced Chancellor Theobald von Batemann Hallwig to declare unrestricted submarine warfare, with the goal of starving Britain out of the war. German planners estimated that unrestricted submarine warfare would cost Britain a monthly shipping loss of 600,000 tons. The general staff acknowledged that the policy would almost certainly bring the United States into the conflict, but calculated that British shipping losses would be so high that they would be forced to sue for peace after five to six months, before American intervention could make an impact. Tonnage sunk rose above 500,000 tons per month from February to July. It peaked at 860,000 tons in April. After July, the newly reintroduced convoy system became effective in reducing the U-boat threat. Britain was safe from starvation, while German industrial output fell, and the United States joined the war far earlier than Germany had anticipated. On May 3, 1917, during the Nivelle Offensive, the French 2nd Colonial Division, veterans of the Battle of Verdun, refused orders, arriving drunk and without their weapons. Their officers lacked the means to punish an entire division, and harsh measures were not immediately implemented. The French army mutinies eventually spread to a further 54 French divisions, and 20,000 men deserted. However, appeals to patriotism and duty, as well as mass arrests and trials, encouraged the soldiers to return to defend their trenches, although the French soldiers refused to participate in further offensive action. Robert Nivelle was removed from command by 15th of May, replaced by General Philippe Peta, who suspended bloody large-scale attacks. The victory of the Central Powers at the Battle of Caporetto led the Allies to convene the Rapallo Conference at which they formed the Supreme War Council to coordinate planning. Previously, British and French armies had operated under separate commands. In December, the Central Powers signed an armistice with Russia thus freeing large numbers of German troops for use in the West. With German reinforcements and new American troops pouring in, the outcome was to be decided on the Western Front. The Central Powers knew that they could not win a protracted war, but they held high hopes for success based on a final quick offensive. Furthermore, both sides became increasingly fearful of social unrest and revolution in Europe. Thus, both sides urgently sought a decisive victory. In 1917, Emperor Charles I of Austria secretly attempted separate peace negotiations with Clemenceau, through his wife's brother Sixtus in Belgium as an intermediary, without the knowledge of Germany. Italy opposed the proposals. When the negotiations failed, his attempt was revealed to Germany, resulting in a diplomatic catastrophe. Ottoman Empire Conflict, 1917-1918 In March and April 1917, at the First and Second Battles of Gaza, German and Ottoman forces stopped the advance of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, which had begun in August 1916 at the Battle of Romani. At the end of October, the Sinai and Palestine campaign resumed, when General Edmund Allenby's 20th Corps, 21 Corps and Desert Mounted Corps won the Battle of Beersheba. Two Ottoman armies were defeated a few weeks later at the Battle of Mugaridge and, early in December, Jerusalem was captured following another Ottoman defeat at the Battle of Jerusalem. About this time, Friedrich Freiherr Kress von Kressenstein was relieved of his duties as the 8th Army's commander, replaced by Javed Pasha, and a few months later the commander of the Ottoman army in Palestine, Erich von Falkenhayn, was replaced by Otto Lehmann von Sanders. In early 1918, the front line was extended and the Jordan Valley was occupied. 
following the first Transjordan and the second Transjordan attacks by British Empire forces in March and April 1918. In March, most of the Egyptian expeditionary forces British infantry and yeomanry cavalry were sent to the Western Front as a consequence of the spring offensive. They were replaced by Indian Army units. During several months of reorganization and training of the summer, a number of attacks were carried out on sections of the Ottoman front line. These pushed the front line north to more advantageous positions for the Entente in preparation for an attack and to acclimatize the newly arrived Indian Army infantry. It was not until the middle of September that the integrated force was ready for large-scale operations. The reorganized Egyptian expeditionary force, with an additional mounted division, broke Ottoman forces at the Battle of Megiddo in September 1918. In two days the British and Indian infantry, supported by a creeping barrage, broke the Ottoman front line and captured the headquarters of the 8th Army, Ottoman Empire, at Tulkarm, the continuous trench lines at Tapsir, Arara, and the 7th Army, Ottoman Empire, headquarters at Nablus. The Desert Mounted Corps rode through the break in the front line created by the infantry. During virtually continuous operations by Australian Light Horse, British Mounted Yeomanry, Indian Lancers, and New Zealand Mounted Rifle Brigades in the Jezreel Valley, they captured Nazareth, Afula, and Basin, Jenin, along with Haifa on the Mediterranean coast and Dara east of the Jordan River on the Hejaz Railway. Samak and Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee were captured on the way northwards to Damascus. Meanwhile, Chater's force of Australian Light Horse, New Zealand Mounted Rifles, Indian, British West Indies and Jewish Infantry captured the crossings of the Jordan River, Essalt, Amman and at Ziza most of the Fourth Army, Ottoman Empire. The Armistice of Mudros, signed at the end of October, ended hostilities with the Ottoman Empire when fighting was continuing north of Aleppo. August 15, 1917, Peace Offer by the Pope on or shortly before August 15, 1917 Pope Benedict XV made a peace proposal suggesting No annexations No indemnities, except to compensate for severe war damage in Belgium and parts of France and of Serbia. A solution to the problems of Alsace-Lorraine, Trentino, and Trieste. Restoration of the Kingdom of Poland Germany to pull out of Belgium and France. Germany's overseas colonies to be returned to Germany. General disarmament. A Supreme Court of Arbitration to settle future disputes between nations. The freedom of the seas. Abolish all retaliatory economic conflicts. No point in ordering reparations, because so much damage had been caused to all belligerents. Entry of the United States At the outbreak of the war, the United States pursued a policy of non-intervention, avoiding conflict while trying to broker peace. When the German U-boat U-20 sank the British liner RMS Lusitania on May 7, 1915 with 128 Americans among the dead, President Woodrow Wilson insisted that America is too proud to fight but demanded an end to attacks on passenger ships. Germany complied. Wilson unsuccessfully tried to mediate a settlement. However, he also repeatedly warned that the United States would not tolerate unrestricted submarine warfare, in violation of international law. Former President Theodore Roosevelt denounced German acts as piracy. Wilson was narrowly re-elected in 1916 after campaigning with the slogan he kept us out of war. In January 1917, Germany decided to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, realizing it would mean American entry. The German foreign minister, in the Zimmermann telegram, invited Mexico to join the war as Germany's ally against the United States. In return, the Germans would finance Mexico's war and help it recover the territories of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The United Kingdom intercepted the message and presented it to the U.S. Embassy in the U.K. From there it made its way to President Wilson who released the Zimmerman note to the public, and Americans saw it as casus belli. Wilson called on anti-war elements to end all wars, by winning this one and eliminating militarism from the globe. He argued that the war was so important that the U.S. had to have a voice in the peace conference. 
After the sinking of seven U.S. merchant ships by submarines and the publication of the Zimmermann telegram, Wilson called for war on Germany on April 2, 1917, which the U.S. Congress declared four days later. The United States was never formally a member of the Allies but became a self-styled associated power. The United States had a small army, but, after the passage of the Selective Service Act, it drafted 2.8 million men, and, by summer 1918, was sending 10,000 fresh soldiers to France every day. In 1917, the U.S. Congress granted U.S. citizenship to Puerto Ricans to allow them to be drafted to participate in World War I, as part of the jones shafroth Act. German general staff assumptions that it would be able to defeat the British and French forces before American troops reinforced them were proven incorrect. The United States Navy sent a battleship group to Scapa Flow to join with the British Grand Fleet, destroyers to Queenstown, Ireland, and submarines to help guard convoys. Several regiments of U.S. Marines were also dispatched to France. The British and French wanted American units used to reinforce their troops already on the battle lines and not waste scarce shipping on bringing over supplies. General John J. Pershing, American Expeditionary Forces, AEF, Commander, refused to break up American units to be used as filler material. As an exception, he did allow African-American combat regiments to be used in French divisions. The Harlem Hellfighters fought as part of the French 16th Division, and earned the unit Poix de Guerre for their actions at Chateau Thierry, Below Wood, and Sokolb. Eighth Doctrine called for the use of frontal assaults which had long since been discarded by British Empire and French commanders due to the large loss of life that resulted. German Spring Offensive of 1918 Ludendorff drew up plans, codenamed Operation Michael, for the 1918 offensive on the Western Front. The Spring Offensive sought to divide the British and French forces with a series of feints and advances. The German leadership hoped to end the war before significant U.S. forces arrived. The operation commenced on March 21, 1918 with an attack on British forces near Saint-Canton. German forces achieved an unprecedented advance of 60 kilometers, 37 miles. British and French trenches were penetrated using novel infiltration tactics, also named Houdier tactics after General Oscar van Houdier, by specially trained units called stormtroopers. Previously, attacks had been characterized by long artillery bombardments and massed assaults. In the spring offensive of 1918, however, Ludendorff used artillery only briefly and infiltrated small groups of infantry at weak points. They attacked command and logistics areas and bypassed points of serious resistance. More heavily armed infantry then destroyed these isolated positions. This German success relied greatly on the element of surprise. The front moved to within 120 kilometers, 75 miles, of Paris. Three heavy Krupp railway guns fired 183 shells on the capital, causing many Parisians to flee. The initial offensive was so successful that Kaiser Wilhelm II declared 24th of March a national holiday. Many Germans thought victory was near. After heavy fighting, however, the offensive was halted. Lacking tanks or motorized artillery, the Germans were unable to consolidate their gains. The problems of resupply were also exacerbated by increasing distances that now stretched over terrain that was shell-torn and often impassable to traffic. General Foch pressed to use the arriving American troops as individual replacements, whereas Pershing sought to field American units as an independent force. These units were assigned to the depleted French and British Empire commands on 28 March. A Supreme War Council of Allied Forces was created at the Dulles Conference on November 5, 1917. General Foch was appointed as Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces. Haig, Peita, and Pershing retained tactical control of their respective armies, Foch assumed a coordinating rather than a directing role, and the British, French, and U.S. commands operated largely independently. Following Operation Michael, Germany launched Operation Georgette against the Northern English Channel ports. The Allies halted the drive after limited territorial gains by Germany. The German army to the south then conducted operations Blucher and York, pushing broadly towards Paris. Germany launched Operation Marne, Second Battle of the Marne, on 15th of July, in an attempt to encircle Reims. The resulting counterattack, which started the Hundred Days Offensive, marked the first successful Allied offensive of the war. By 20th of July, the Germans had retreated across the Marne to their starting lines, having achieved little, and the German army never regained the initiative. 
German casualties between March and April 1918 were 270,000, including many highly trained stormtroopers. Meanwhile, Germany was falling apart at home. Anti-war marches became frequent and morale in the army fell. Industrial output was half the 1913 levels. New states entered the war. In the late spring of 1918, three new states were formed in the South Caucasus, the First Republic of Armenia, the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Georgia, which declared their independence from the Russian Empire. Two other minor entities were established, the Centro-Caspian Dictatorship and Southwest Caucasian Republic, the former was liquidated by Azerbaijan in the autumn of 1918 and the latter by a joint Armenian-British task force in early 1919. With the withdrawal of the Russian armies from the Caucasus Front in the winter of 1917-18, the three major republics braced for an imminent Ottoman advance, which commenced in the early months of 1918. Solidarity was briefly maintained when the Transcaucasian Federative Republic was created in the spring of 1918, but this collapsed in May, when the Georgians asked for and received protection from Germany and the Azerbaijanis concluded a treaty with the Ottoman Empire that was more akin to a military alliance. Armenia was left to fend for itself and struggled for five months against the threat of a full-fledged occupation by the Ottoman Turks before defeating them at the Battle of Sardarabad. Allied Victory, Summer 1918 Onwards Hundred Days Offensive The Allied Counteroffensive, known as the Hundred Days Offensive, began on August 8, 1918, with the Battle of Amyan. The battle involved over 400 tanks and 120,000 British, Dominion, and French troops, and by the end of its first day a gap 24 kilometers, 15 miles, long had been created in the German lines. The defenders displayed a marked collapse in morale, causing Ludendorff to refer to this day as the Black Day of the German Army. After an advance as far as 23 kilometers, 14 miles, German resistance stiffened, and the battle was concluded on 12th of August. Rather than continuing the Amyan battle past the point of initial success, as had been done so many times in the past, the Allies shifted attention elsewhere. Allied leaders had now realized that to continue an attack after resistance had hardened was a waste of lives, and it was better to turn the line than to try to roll over it. They began to undertake attacks in quick order to take advantage of successful advances on the flanks, then broke them off when each attack lost its initial impetus. The day after the offensive began, Ludendorff said, we cannot win the war anymore, but we must not lose it either. On 11th of August he offered his resignation to the Kaiser, who refused it, replying, I see that we must strike a balance. We have nearly reached the limit of our powers of resistance. The war must be ended. On 13th of August, at Spa, Hindenburg, Ludendorff, the Chancellor, and Foreign Minister Hintz agreed that the war could not be ended militarily and, on the following day, the German Crown Council decided that victory in the field was now most improbable. Austria and Hungary warned that they could only continue the war until December, and Ludendorff recommended immediate peace negotiations. Prince Ruprecht warned Prince Max of Baden, Our military situation has deteriorated so rapidly that I no longer believe we can hold out over the winter, it is even possible that a catastrophe will come earlier. Equals Battle of Albert Equals British and Dominion forces launched the next phase of the campaign with the Battle of Albert on 21st of August. The assault was widened by French and then further British forces in the following days. During the last week of August the Allied pressure along the 110-kilometer, 68 miles, front against the enemy was heavy and unrelenting. From German accounts, each day was spent in bloody fighting against an ever and again on storming enemy, and nights passed without sleep and retirements to new lines. Faced with these advances, on 2nd of September the German Supreme Army Command issued orders to withdraw in the south to the Hindenburg Line. This seeded without a fight the salient seized the previous April. According to Ludendorff, we had to admit the necessity, to withdraw the entire front from the Scarpe to the Val. In nearly four weeks of fighting beginning on 8th of August, over 100,000 German prisoners were taken. The German High Command realized that the war was lost and made attempts to reach a satisfactory end. On 10th of September Hindenburg urged peace moves to Emperor Charles of Austria, and Germany appealed to the Netherlands for mediation. 
On 14 September Austria sent a note to all belligerents and neutrals suggesting a meeting for peace talks on neutral soil, and on 15 September Germany made a peace offer to Belgium. Both peace offers were rejected. Allied advance to the Hindenburg Line In September the Allies advanced to the Hindenburg Line in the north and center. The Germans continued to fight strong rear guard actions and launched numerous counterattacks, but positions and outposts of the line continued to fall, with the Bifalone taking 30,441 prisoners in the last week of September. On 24 of September an assault by both the British and French came within 3 kilometers, 2 miles, of St. Quentin. The Germans had now retreated to positions along or behind the Hindenburg Line. That same day, Supreme Army Command informed the leaders in Berlin that armistice talks were inevitable. The final assault on the Hindenburg Line began with the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, launched by French and American troops on 26 September. The following week, cooperating French and American units broke through in Champagne at the Battle of Blanc Montana Ridge, forcing the Germans off the commanding heights, and closing towards the Belgian frontier. On 8 of October the line was pierced again by British and Dominion troops at the Battle of Cambrai. The German army had to shorten its front and use the Dutch frontier as an anchor to fight rear guard actions as it fell back towards Germany. When Bulgaria signed a separate armistice on 29 September, Ludendorff, having been under great stress for months, suffered something similar to a breakdown. It was evident that Germany could no longer mount a successful defense. The collapse of the Balkans meant that Germany was about to lose its main supplies of oil and food. Its reserves had been used up, even as U.S. troops kept arriving at the rate of 10,000 per day. The Americans supplied more than 80% of Allied oil during the war, and there was no shortage. German Revolution 1918-1919 News of Germany's impending military defeat spread throughout the German armed forces. The threat of mutiny was rife. Admiral Reinhard Scheer and Ludendorff decided to launch a last attempt to restore the valor of the German Navy. In northern Germany, the German Revolution of 1918-1919 began at the end of October 1918. Units of the German Navy refused to set sail for a last, large-scale operation in a war they believed to be as good as lost, initiating the uprising. The sailors' revolt which then ensued in the naval ports of Wilhelmshaven and Kiel, spread across the whole country within days and led to the proclamation of a republic on November 9, 1918, shortly thereafter to the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, and to German surrender. New German Government Surrenders With the military faltering and with widespread loss of confidence in the Kaiser leading to his abdication and fleeing of the country, Germany moved towards surrender. Prince Maximilian of Baden took charge of a new government on 3 October as Chancellor of Germany to negotiate with the Allies. Negotiations with President Wilson began immediately, in the hope that he would offer better terms than the British and French. Wilson demanded a constitutional monarchy and parliamentary control over the German military. There was no resistance when the Social Democrat Philip Scheidemann on 9 November declared Germany to be a republic. The Kaiser Kings and other hereditary rulers all were removed from power and Wilhelm fled to exile in the Netherlands. Imperial Germany was dead, a new Germany had been born as the Weimar Republic. Armistices and Capitulations The collapse of the Central Powers came swiftly. Bulgaria was the first to sign an armistice, the Armistice of Salonika on September 29, 1918. On 30 October the Ottoman Empire capitulated, signing the Armistice of Mudros. On 24 October, the Italians began a push that rapidly recovered territory lost after the Battle of Caporetto. This culminated in the Battle of Vittorio Veneto, which marked the end of the Austro-Hungarian army as an effective fighting force. The offensive also triggered the disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. During the last week of October, Declarations of independence were made in Budapest, Prague, and Zagreb. On 29 of October, the imperial authorities asked Italy for an armistice, but the Italians continued advancing, reaching Trento, Udine, and Trieste. On 3 of November, Austria-Hungary sent a flag of truce to ask for an armistice, armistice of Villa Giusti. The terms, arranged by telegraph with the Allied authorities in Paris, were communicated to the Austrian commander and accepted. 
The armistice with Austria was signed in the village Usti, near Padua, on 3rd of November. Austria and Hungary signed separate armistices following the overthrow of the Habsburg monarchy. In the following days the Italian army occupied Innsbruck and Alderol with 20 to 22,000 soldiers. On 11th of November, at 5 a.m., an armistice with Germany was signed in a railroad carriage at Compiègne. At 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month a ceasefire came into effect. During the six hours between the signing of the armistice and its taking effect, opposing armies on the Western Front began to withdraw from their positions, but fighting continued along many areas of the front, as commanders wanted to capture territory before the war ended. The occupation of the Rhineland took place following the armistice. The occupying armies consisted of American, Belgian, British and French forces. In November 1918, the Allies had ample supplies of men and materiel to invade Germany. Yet at the time of the armistice, no Allied force had crossed the German frontier, the Western Front was still some 720 kilometers, 450 miles, from Berlin, and the Kaiser's armies had retreated from the battlefield in good order. These factors enabled Hindenburg and other senior German leaders to spread the story that their armies had not really been defeated. This resulted in the stab in the back legend, which attributed Germany's defeat not to its inability to continue fighting, even though up to a million soldiers were suffering from the 1918 flu pandemic and unfit to fight, but to the public's failure to respond to its patriotic calling and the supposed intentional sabotage of the war effort, particularly by Jews, socialists, and Bolsheviks. The Allies had much more potential wealth they could spend on the war. One estimate, using 1913 U.S. dollars, is that the Allies spent $58 billion on the war and the Central Powers only $25 billion. Among the Allies, the U.K. spent $21 billion and the U.S. $17 billion, among the Central Powers Germany spent $20 billion.